present to you Hadi. Hadi is really awesome. Uh, Hadi had a really cool talk on DevOps last year, complaining about everything. I like it a lot. <laughs> but today he's going to talk about Kotlin, and he's one of the major people behind Kotlin. He works for IntelliJ. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Are, Are we going to dim the lights or? OK, so yeah, so um, he had a, he had a, apparently I did a good talk that he liked. That's why he's picked the talk he doesn't like. So <laughs> we'll start with that. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, glad that you've uh, stayed for this uh, Kotlin session. Uh, my name is Hadi. I work at JetBrains on different things. Uh, and I'm going to give you a brief insight into Kotlin in the language, uh, our goals, what it is we're trying to do. And um, hopefully, you'll walk out of here saying, that's it, I'm switching to Kotlin. How many of you here are actually playing with Kotlin or have used it or have seen it before? OK, good. So you're, you're my target audience, more people that haven't. Right, to give you, to give you some background, uh, this is a language that was started in 2010 by JetBrains. Uh, we were looking for a language that kind of complied with a certain series of uh, needs that we had at the time. Uh, and because the majority of our tools, except the stuff that's on the .NET side, is written in Java. So b despite doing an uh, IDE for any language out there, most of, our langu most of the la uh, tools that we're writing are actually using Java. And so we needed a language, and we uh, decided to kind of look at the things that were out there. And our main kind of um, candidates were Scala and uh, Ceylon at the time. Each of them had their issues for us. I'm not saying that they have issues. I'm saying for us, they had issues. Uh, Scala had performance issues. Tooling for Scala isn't the easiest thing to do in the world. We know, you know, to give you some perspective, there's about, if there's about 25 people working on IntelliJ, six people are working on the Scala plugin. Um, and we needed certain characteristics of the language. So Scala kind of left as a candidate, and then we went to um, Ceylon, and we actually started to work with Ceylon. And then at some point, Ceylon's goals, targets diverged from ours. These are our goals, basically. You know, we have a lar large code base. We've got 10 years of, or now 16 years of code written in Java, and we couldn't close shop and say, you know what, let's rewrite this in Clojure or something like that. We had to have something that we could gradually adopt and work with our existing code base. So for us, interoperability was one of the key factors. And the other characteristics that we were looking for was something concise, expressive, toolable. But in essence, pragmatic. And it's been developed under Apache 2 OSS, on, and it's available on GitHub. The current state, we released it on February 2016, 15th of February, where there's around 20 plus developers at JetBrains right now working on it. Uh, we've got 100 committers, obviously, inside and outside of JetBrains. It's now being used, again, we did this out of need, so it's being used in close to 10 products at JetBrains. Pretty much any new project that we start is now using Kotlin, if it's on the JVM, which the majority are. And most of the products like IntelliJ, Upsource, QTrack, a lot of these products uh, are using Intel, uh, Kotlin already. Some products are entirely written in Kotlin. Uh, so you know we are dog feeding, dog, dog fooding it ourselves very extensively, and we are committed to it by actually uh, using it in our own products. External companies, you know, I don't like to typically, typically name drop, but I will. Um, there's Expedia, NBC News, Digital, Netflix. We had a, a, an event last week at, uh, in San Francisco that Netflix was also participating in, and I believe that they're using it for some internal things. And also last week, we announced Gradle, um, which is an awesome little animated GIF. Uh, so how many of you use Gradle? OK, so Gradle announced last week, I don't know if you heard, that from 3.0, they were going to be providing a Kotlin DSL. Uh, so you can still use the groovy stuff, uh, but they're also going to be uh, providing a Kotlin DSL. And I always forget to mention, but Kotlin is actually a static language. So in essence, that is somewhat uh, different to what you have now in Gradle. Where can you use it? Uh, anywhere. Uh, you know, given that it's Android compatible, it's had a lot of surge on the Android market. A lot of people use it because it's compatible with Java 6 and it provides a very small runtime. So it's had a lot of success in Android. But we never created a language for Android specifically. 
We did add things to make it easier for Android, but it wasn't targeted at Android. It was targeted at our own needs initially, right? Which is create developer tools, create server-side tools, any kind of thing. So really, you can use it in any kind of scenario. It's very much inspired by Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Groovy, Scala. And we're very open about this. We've taken great things from these languages, and we've put them into, into Kotlin. But this also provides us with a, a benefit, which is of low ramp up time. So you can actually get to grips with Kotlin very easily. And I will challenge you today to point out maybe one or two things that you won't completely understand from the code I show you. Our whole idea is that people that are Java developers or C Sharp or JavaScript developers can easily, easily adapt Kotlin. And again, given that it's interoperable, it allows you to do a gradual adoption. You don't have to necessarily say, you know what, OK, it's a new language. Let me try these in tests, which is what we always do. Here, you can actually mix and match as much as you want. And how can you use it? You know, we've always intended this to be free, open source, et cetera. So you can use it from the command line. You can use it from Maven, from Gradle, Cobalt, which is a flavor of Gradle using uh, Kotlin. And anyone use Ant here still? OK, well, you, oh, you do. OK, it's awesome. No, no, no it's not. Um, you can use it from Ant. Uh, IntelliJ idea, both the Ultimate and Community Edition, Android Studio. And we are creating also, we've created an Eclipse plugin. And hopefully someday someone in the community will pick that up. Um, uh, I didn't mention NetBeans. Any NetBeans users? So we have command line support for that. Um, <laughs> did I just say that? Anyway, um, OK, with that, let's see some code. Any questions? No? Brilliant. Uh, no, seriously, if you have any questions, just keep them to yourself. No, I'm joking. Just ask me, and I'll try and answer. So. So that I don't answer questions, awesome. OK, so here is, uh, this is my hipster layout in IntelliJ. You can see it's hits, hipster because it's got split windows. Um, so on this side, I have customer in Java. And in this side, what I'm going to do is show you customer in Kotlin. OK, and that kind of, I'd like to start with that because that kind of summarizes what we're trying to do here. Okay? We're trying to really cut down on boilerplate code and make things kind of concise. So here what you have is, here you know what you have. You have a customer in Java, uh, which is with its private fields, its getters and setters, and then you have a bunch of two string equals hash code, et cetera. On the left-hand side, I've got exactly the same thing. The difference is I don't have all of this boilerplate code. What I have is a, uh, is a class. And the primary constructor in Kotlin is defined like this. So you can actually pass in the, um, the constructor values. You can pass in uh, directly on the same line as a class definition. And you can actually declare the properties there as well. So here I'm saying I have a class that has ID, first name, last name, and email. And in fact, these classes, these properties are exactly the same as uh, in the Java in that they're read-write. If I want a property that's read-only, then I will just use val. Obviously similar to other languages, Scala, et cetera. So here I can now create an only getter method. Okay, you can also initialize values here and do whatever you want on the constructor. Now, the additional thing that we have here is this data thing. And this data thing, what it's basically doing is adding a two string equals and hash code. Right? So I don't need to write this every single time myself. Now you say, OK, big deal. I mean, any good IDE is generating this code for me. Yes, we're actually trying to put ourselves out of business. Um, the point here is that, yes, it's generating code for you. But at the end of the day, you have to go through this code. You have to look at this code. Even if you don't maintain this code, you have to open this file and figure out, is this code something that is custom, or is this just boilerplate generated code? Every time I, you know, if, if, if we are crazy enough to still use ORMs, anytime I'm using an ORM and I'm mapping to that ORM, oh, I've added a new field. Now I've got to go and update my get equals and my hash code, et cetera, to reflect that change. All of this is now done for you. You don't have to have all of this boilerplate code. OK, so let's go and let me just also, after this, start show you how easy it is basically to get up and running. So I have a Kotlin application here. You can target JVM and JavaScript. That's also something I haven't mentioned. Um, so Kotlin is basically targeted at JVM. Initially, it was targeted at JVM. Then we, we, we realized that if we don't target JavaScript, we're going to lose out on all the potential hipsters. So we said, let's target JavaScript as well. Uh, and no disrespect to hipsters. I love them. I kind of consider myself one when I wear different pants. Um, so, and we. 
Our main focus in 1.0 was JVM, although there is uh, JavaScript support. However, in 1.1 coming forward, we're focusing even more on the JavaScript stuff, which is beneficial because, for example, if you're doing some JavaScript stuff and some Java stuff, and you have something that you want to share in terms of, for instance, business logic, etc., you can write it once and then deploy to two different outputs. Said that, I'll create a next project, and I'll call it untitled 607,001, just in case I, I have the 30. Um, Kotlin comes with a very small runtime. So it's, it's under one meg. We try very hard to keep it under one meg. And I can just say Kotlin um, main. I can call this anything I want. Main is our basically entry point. And then print line, hello, gang of five. Okay, and then I can run this and output. So the first thing that you notice here is that we don't have a public static class. You have what you have top level functions. So very similar to JavaScript. And in fact, um, so if we open up functions, you can not not that one functions, oh, wrong project. If you open up functions over here, let me just close this so that we go back to a single layout. You can see that you have these top level functions. And so how many of you have created static classes for utility file functions? Everyone, right? And you have like the utility class, and then your colleague comes along and says, right, I need a new function. Let me put it in um, helper class. And then the third person comes along and says, well, I can't find any utility classes. I'll call it my utility class, and so on and so forth. And you end up with all of these utility classes and all of these functions that you don't know where to really put them. So you create all of these static objects. Now, with Kotlin, you don't have that issue, because now you can just put functions in files and then spend the rest of your life looking for those files, kind of like you do in JavaScript. Um, you know, we, we've half solved the issue. But obviously what we've done here is get rid of the, the, the aspect of having to create all of this overhead of the classes and you can just create functions. You can see that you have string interpolation to kind of make things easier. This is basically the idea of um, optional parameters. So I can actually have multiple parameters and then have an optional parameter passed in. The benefit of this, is, again, is, is really pragmatic benefit. is just to get rid of the boilerplate code of having overloaded versions of functions. Right? If I just want to have a different function with different parameters, I can do this. I mean, if there's anyone in C Sharp, any C Sharp developers in the room, you know that we've had these for, for years on end. Uh, you can also, having optional parameters, you can also have named parameters. So given that I can have named parameters, I can now change the order of the parameters, pass in spe special, specific ones, not pass in. Kotlin is very big in type, type inference as well, although it's a static function, a static language. It is big in type inference. So here you can see that Kotlin follows the, the, the convention of type, I'm sorry, the variable name and then the type and the return, function, the return value of a function is the, the same thing. By default, it's unit, which is kind of equivalent to void. And what you can do is just avoid having to be explicit about this. And what you can also do is avoid having to open curly braces, close curly braces. If it's a single expression, you can pretty much just return it on the function. Now, this also provides, you know, the type inference also comes in the functions as well, so uh, in, in anything. So, for instance, here, if I have val, I could say, for example, val is abc of type string, and then I initialize it to hello, or, and also notice semicolons are optional. In, except for one place. But it's great because now you don't no longer have to go to Hacker News and have debates about whether to use semicolons in JavaScript. You can also have it about Kotlin, right? Um, but I don't need to declare the type. So I can just say val abc equals hello, which creates a read only pro, um, va variable or write variable. Now, uh, if you're familiar with what's coming up in, I think it's Java 9, is it in Java 9, that they want to introduce type inference? Um, and how many of you are in favor of, the, of this type of type inference? Okay. How many of you are against? Obviously, everyone else. Or how many people have no opinion? How many people are still awake? Okay. So uh, the, a lot of people say, you know, the, the problem with this is that if I say that this is like a list, and I say list of, um, you know, list of whatever, I don't know now if, the, if there's no type inference, I don't know if this is a list of cars or a list of airplanes. Of course you don't. Here's how you can fix it. You call that cars, right? <laughs> 
And trust me, eight years ago, we had the same debate in C-sharp, right? Everyone said VAR is going to kill C-sharp. It's going to kill the expressive number. It's going to kill everything that you ever knew. We're all alive still. We also have seen a lot of people move to JavaScript. I don't know if that's a result of this or not. Um, I, for one, would want to kill JavaScript. OK, so, and of course, you can also pass in multiple parameters on arguments in, in, in Kotlin. And we'll see that this is also useful for functions. So now, another issue that we have in, in life um, is Customer service in Java. So you can see here, this is the typical Java code. And I say customer in Java being passed in. If customer is not null, if customer.get first name is not null, if customer.get first name starts with whatever, throw exception. And you also have this checked exceptions, which you don't have in Kotlin. Now, in Kotlin, if I do customer service, you can see that the first thing you'll notice is that I'm not checking for nulls, right? Because by and large, Kotlin does not have nulls. By default, when you declare a type in Kotlin, it's not allowed to be null. Okay, So we've gotten rid of nulls by saying you can't have nulls. And this makes it easier to not have to do null checks. Now you can do instead empty string checks. I kid. Um, so, so anyway, but the problem is that since we want this to be interoperable and since we want to be able to interact with Java, a lot of Java code that you call is going to return null, right? So we have the option in Kotlin to say a type can be nullable. Whether it's a Kotlin type or whether it's a call from Java, you can introduce the question mark, which basically means that now this type can actually be nullable. If it is that, then what you see that the compiler introduces an error here saying that you cannot call this because this can potentially give a null reference exception. If you want to ignore the co uh, compiler and say, I don't care, I want to shoot myself in the foot, you can put a double hash bang, and then it will cause a null reference exception to bring back that nostalgia. If you want to do it in a safe way, obviously what you can do is say, if customer is not null, then do whatever. Um, but we have a shorthand for that, which is the Elvis operator. And basically, it's adding that question mark and saying, if it's not null, then invoke this call on this method. Okay, But by and large, we've tried to eliminate the issues of null reference exceptions by saying that you cannot have null. Well, you cannot have, by default, you don't have nullable types. If you want to have nullable types, then you can declare them like that. Or in the case of a variable, for instance, I could say var abc string and declare it as a nullable type. Any questions so far now, this, this time seriously? Yes? So the question is, um, null is a very good default value, and what do you do when you declare an array and you have nulls? Um, I mean, what is the array? It really is dependent on what exactly it is that you're trying to initialize. Yeah. You could just in, in, initialize the array as, an empty, as empty. Pardon? Hold on. I can't hear you. Uh, it's kind of the same question. When you have fields, what is the default value for the fields? When you have what? Fields. OK, Kotlin doesn't allow fields. So we've oh. solved that problem. Cool. <laughs> So actually, there is no fields in Kotlin. There are situations in which you want to be able to have a nullable type. For instance, um, let's say that, uh, or not a nullable type, a type that is initialized later on. For example, if you're doing dependency injection and you want to have some property initialized later on, we actually have a keyword called late, excuse me, late init, which allows you to initialize a variable saying that it's not going to be null, but at some point will be lately initialized. Um, beforehand, before that, we used to have a delegate, which I'll show you, which is delegated properties, which are, we, it was lazy, evalu uh, lazy initialized, um, but we've actually introduced a keyword, which is late in it. Um, so, but I'll get to that. One more question? Yes. Uh, you said that in Kotlin you don't have checked exception. So how does that work with libraries from Java, for example, that are actually throwing them? So the question, oh, you, you heard the question. Um, so in, in what sense? In consuming libraries that are being thrown from, from consuming libraries, uh, API calls that are throwing exceptions from Java. 
Yes, in what sense, how does it work? I mean, you, you consume it, you don't have to declare or anything on the Kotlin side. Oh, okay, so there is support for that. You're just yes, we just don't, you don't have to explicitly um, uh, call, uh, name it. There is also an annotation, which is throw exceptions, which is used for some certain cases. Okay, so a lot of the code that I'm showing you, obviously, it is really for the idea of trying to uh, you know, take, uh, bring home the same point over and over again. This is about little pragmatic things. This isn't about, you know, if you want to have a complete mind shift from what you're doing, then you should look at Haskell, which is an amazing language. Um, but this is not about that. This is about little things that we believe add up to make it easier in terms of development or more enjoyable at least. So here we have a, a class constructor. You can have multiple constructors. Um, initially that wasn't an option, but we re-added secondary constructors. You can have an init block where you can basically, because this is your primary constructor, if you have some code that you cannot initialize as a parameter val val value, for instance, you can actually create that in an init block and then just use the braces to um, initialize whatever you want there. We, we actually have lazy uh, evaluation for, for as well. Initially, it was called streams, and then Java 8 came out and called it streams, so we renamed it to a sequence, um, which is similar to Haskell as well, in a sense. In a sense. Although Haskell, everything is lazy. Um, uh, so I have a sequence, and then I can do kind of like, like a lazy evaluation of, of that um, thing. Notice this is like Haskell. If I want to just create a numbers of 1 to 100, I can just do 1 dot dot 100. Okay. Now, let me go to ADT. Oh, also, I didn't mention, but in the, in the library, we also ship a bunch of functional constructs. So you have things like filter, sorted, map, flat map, etc. And notice that you know when we're declaring types, lists, etc., it's very concise also. And I can even do things like two because you can use infix notation in Kotlin. So this two is just a built-in function which just takes a pair of values and creates. A, well, it takes two values and creates a pair, right? So you can use this kind of um, more expressive notation. And last but not least, in terms of code, um, how many of you are familiar with algebraic data types? So from, from Haskell, for example, you know, a, a Boolean is an algebraic data type because it could be true or false. Uh, a customer could be good or bad. It's not, a per, it's not a value of the customer. It could be of one type or another. And, and to give you an example of where this is useful, here I have a page which is called get page. And when the page is called, it can either throw an exception, which in my case I don't want to. If it returns a good result, I want to access the URL, for instance. If it returns a bad result, I want to access the error message. Now, if you're going to do this, you're either going to have to do it with exceptions or you're going to have to do it with a type that basically has five parameters. And then you've got to see if is error, then access these properties. If not, access those properties. Here we're doing something similar. We're saying if, you know, based on the result, if it's success, access these properties. If it's error, access these properties. And notice that there's actually a, a cast, a, a smart cast again here. The difference is that there are actually two independent structures here. So someone that's reading this code would know exactly what properties apply to a good result and what properties apply to a bad result. And this is something that's enabled through algebraic data types, which in Kotlin there isn't first class support for it, but you can kind of simulate with this by saying that this is a uh, a class that uh, is a page result that has a class success that implements page result, a class error that implements page result. And the sealed keyword here is basically saying that pretty much these are the classes that are implementing page result and nothing else. Okay, So it gives way to being able to do this kind of more um, expressive and readable code in a sense. Okay, Now with that, let me switch back to slides and I've got a few more slides to go through. So this is Anko. Anyone doing um, Android development? OK, so in Anko, what we've done, basically, this is some of the con constructs that I've shown you. What you can do effectively is create your views using um, Kotlin instead of XML. OK, so this is the language for Anko. Uh, with this, there's one also now for JavaFX. If you're using JavaFX, it's called TornadoFX or something like that. Anko is by us. JavaFX isn't. It's by um, someone else. 
Android Extensions is something that is a plugin that we created for Android Studio and for IntelliJ. This is also maintained by us. And the, the issue is when you're doing Android, you have to do a lot of this. In a find view, the text view, and then cast it as the actual element type of component you're using. Kotlin has a plugin technology in the compiler where you can plug things in. So what we do here, well, that's what you do with a plugin, right? Um, so what we do here is basically give you statically typed components that you can actually reference in your Android code. So you don't have to do this find by string and then cast it to the actual type. Spring, do you do Spring? A lot of guys in Spring that are already very good fans of Kotlin, and now the Spring Boot generator by default generates Kotlin. Um, so you can you know, just select Kotlin and then have everything generated with Spring. And again, showing that this is not only about Android. This is server side for everything. Cobalt, as I mentioned, again, using some of those constructs that we talked about to create a kind of like a statically typed um, Gradle, so to speak. Spec is a framework that I've built on that eventually I will release this year, I hope. Um, and it's, it's similar to Jasmine. So to, uh, kind of, uh, if you're familiar with Jasmine from JavaScript, it's a more, it's a more expressive way of writing tests. Um, I don't call it a BDD framework because there's no such thing. Uh, so I, you could call it a specification framework if you so wish. And the roadmap, and please note the not a public commitment, in essence means this is our roadmap, what we're working on, but we're not publicly committing to it. There you go. Um, Coroutines, so you have a sync await, data class hierarchies, uh, type aliases, which is basically the idea of having one type named as something else, like type synonyms in, in Haskell, deconstructing in lambdas, bound method references, local delegated properties, Java 8 or 9. Right now, Kotlin is compatible with Java 6, and it will remain compatible with Java 6 for, for the foreseeable future. However, if you say to us that you're using Java 8, then we will start to use certain constructs of bytecode to um, make use of that. Uh, so Java 8, Java 9 support, and as I said, JavaScript. Right, so the next steps for you. If you want to learn more, go to kotlinlang.org. Try kotlinlang.org has an online IDE where you can actually go through a bunch of koans. There's like five levels of koans, and you don't need to download or install anything. And it gives you a good feel for the language. You can work with collections, with DSLs, all these things. If you prefer to do them offline, they're also on GitHub, so you can just pull them from GitHub and do them offline. There's already a bunch of books out. There's Kotlin for Android developers. Kotlin in Action is by my colleagues Dimitri Yemarov and Svetlana. Um, there's like 11 chapters already done, so that will be um, published very, very soon. EAP of Manning is already open. Community, that's old screenshot. We're already over 3,000 people on our Kotlin Slack. Um, and when Slack finds out, they'll, you see, you're not technically allowed to have open source communities on Slack. Um, so, but everyone has them. Um, there is a, there's a Twitter channel as well that you can follow for news and updates. And to summarize, our goal has and always has been to make a pragmatic language. It's not to revolutionize anything. It's to evolutionize. It's to, to find the pain points that you've had, that we've had using Java in particular or some other languages and try and address those. It, we've always aimed for it to have an easy learning curve. If you're familiar with a talk by Rich Hickey, a great talk which is called Simple Made Easy, he distinguishes between the idea of simple and easy. Easy is something that you're, you're familiar with. Simple is something that you might not be easy to grasp, but it's simple. So is Kotlin easy? Yes, I absolutely think so. I mean, I believe that everything I've shown you here, you more or less understood, right? And the silence was... Deafening. Um, just so, because this is being recorded, just for the record, say yes. yes. There you go. I had one guy, some the other say, say no. I'm like, Shh, be quiet. Interoperability provides this low risk adoption. So if you're not, you know, you don't have to say, I'm going to throw out my code base and start from scratch as much as we love to do that as developers. Um, and we always look for the business reasons behind it. Um, here, you can just gradually adopt things. And you can really seamlessly call Kotlin from Java and Java from Kotlin to the point that it even analyzes the idiom. So for example, if you're calling Java from Kotlin, you, don't, you use the get notation. You don't access the property directly. Whereas calling Kotlin, no, the other way around. OK, you got what I mean. 
And this is subjective, but it is enjoyable. And I, in, in fact, um, I was talking to one of the speakers today who we were coming up the service, and he's like, well, you know, how do you sell this to Java? And I say, really, honestly, how do you sell it to Java developers? When people say to me, why would I give me five key features that I would use of IntelliJ over Eclipse? I say there isn't any, right? Just use IntelliJ. If you like it, if you enjoy it, it's the right thing for you. If you don't, then it's not, right? And, and I think that that's the, the, probably the best way because really it's up to the person. But I do find that a lot of people can't pinpoint exactly what they like of IntelliJ over Eclipse or other IDs, but they say, yes, I like it. This the same. I found that as I use Kotlin, and, and I found that people, as they use Kotlin, they start to enjoy it so much. And it's not a single feature that sells it. It's all of those together. And just as a commitment from us, it is here to stay, right? We never made this to create a, an industry around the language, right? We created this out of our own need, and it's got an open source adoption. The, you know, nowadays, it would be crazy to make a language that's not open source. Even Apple had to open source Swift. Uh, so you know, we never did this as like to go into Kotlin consulting. We've done this. Our focus is and remains tooling. So for us, this is another tool that we provide, except it's backed by other tools. And to finalize, as I, I stole this from Brett Miller with his permission, he said, I researched Kotlin last night and then spent the morning looking at mountains of boilerplate Java and Android Studio, and I see why they did it. And I think that's a good reflection of exactly why we did it. So thank you. <laughs>